share. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, um, my name is Gerda Magana and I work for uh, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And my email is gerda.magana.ct.gov if anyone would like to ask some questions later or if you wanna make any comments. So today our talk is about spotted lanternfly, which is an invasive, uh, an invasive insect that has been found already established as a black here. And I cannot, oh, here you go. Here you go, my slides are moving. Um, so what is spotted lanternfly? So the Latin name for spotted lanternfly is Lycorma delicatula. It is an invasive uh, plant hopper from order Hemiptera, which is a true bug. And uh, it has piercing sucking mouth parts, very similar to aphid, even though obviously aphids are really tiny and these are quite large insects. Um, so this insect K is native to China and Southeast Asia. And it's uh, already uh, also an invasive insect in Korea, South Korea and Japan. And it has um, uh, a huge, uh, well, I shouldn't say huge, it's a, a large uh, uh, host range. It has more than 70 uh, plants and trees besides mentioned here. So one of some of the main ones are Ilanthus altissima, which is a uh, tree of heaven, which is also an invasive uh, uh invasive plant tree. It also can attack maple, grape, wild grape, or domesticated grape, black walnut, birch tree, roses, again, uh, domesticated or wild ones like multiflora uh, rose, willow, kiwi, apricot, apples, hops, plums, and many, many other host trees and plants. So where is the spotted lanternfly found? First spotted lanternfly was found in Pennsylvania in 2014 in Berks County. Um, and uh, at, uh, at that time, uh, it was thought that SLF might have been introduced on imported stone from China. The initial uh, spotted lanternfly in populations uh, was found feeding on both tree of heaven and wild grapevine there in Pennsylvania and Berks County. Currently, the spotted lanternfly is found in 34 counties in Pennsylvania, but besides Pennsylvania, it is also found and has established populations in Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Ohio, Virginia, and West, uh, West Virginia. Uh, the first interceptions uh, in Connecticut occurred in 2018 and 2019, and as of uh, end of 2020, the uh, spotted lanternfly populations have been found already in Fairfield County, Connecticut, in Greenwich, Stanford, and New Canaan. Here is uh, a spotted lanternfly uh, distribution map as of June 1st this year. Uh, that's from New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. And as you can see, um, again, it shows you all the states and counties in each state where spotted lanternfly has been found. So the initial in infestation was in Berks County right here, which looked like a diamond, and then it slowly started spreading. Um, as of last year, um, mainly in Pennsylvania, spotted lanternfly was in this area, but at the end of last year, it already spread all the way to Ohio, and of course, Connecticut. Uh, so the purple dots, if you can see on these, uh, on this map are where the spotted lanternfly has been found, but there was no established population. So as you can see, um, this map shows you that spotted lanternfly spreads very quickly since uh, this map is for, as of June this year, and since initial infestation has been found in 2014. So it took about six to seven years uh, to spread so much. This is a map of potential distributions for spotted lanternfly. Um, 
So the red areas have high probability of spotted lanternfly uh, spreading. And as you see, Connecticut has quite a bit. Pennsylvania definitely has a lot. Um, even California has uh, a lot of red areas with high possibilities of uh, spotted lanternfly being established there, which is a, a huge problem since those areas are uh, very highly agricultural, um, even vineyards. And since uh, grape is one of the preferred hosts for spotted lanternfly. Also, there's some red in Washington state and a little bit in Oregon state. Again, Washington state has a lot of orchards and agriculture um, and this area in um, Oregon, the same has quite a bit of agriculture and vineyards as well. And as you can see right now, there's a, a established population in Ohio in the Eastern part of Ohio, Ohio but from there, it can easily spread to Midwest also. So how to identify spotted lanternfly? Adults are about one inch long and females are slightly larger than males. Um, so ad adult lanternflies uh, have tan four wings with black spots and hind wings have lower red patches, the black spots separated with some white in between. Normally, uh, normally when lanternfly is feeding and, and is at rest, you don't actually see the red patches. You see uh, in this resting position, but when it gets, um, disturb or it's flying, then you actually see the, the red, uh, the red uh, coloring flashing. Sexually mature adults, they have these yellow uh, bands on their abdomen. And also, um, which I'm, I'm sure you have heard of, uh, a lot of times when people see spotted lanternfly photos, especially in the open wing position, a lot of people mistake it for a butterfly or a moth, but this is not a butterfly or moth, and uh, it's a true bug, and it does not have prominent antenna like a moth or butterfly would have. Um, it has really small uh, antenna, which is these orange little dots there. Let me see, I'll go back in this photo right here. So this is their antenna, and this is their eye. So definitely not a moth. Okay. Uh, so uh, adult spotted lanternflies are not strong flyers. Um, they do uh, like to move jump, uh, jumping or walking. However, however, they do fly and can fly up to 30, from 32 to 260 feet if they climb to a top of a tree or a light pole something that's tall and launch themselves into the wind. So he, uh, here is a photo of a, uh, uh, a nymph. And, and uh, so first three nymph instars of spotted lanternflies are black with white spots in color. They all look the same except the size changes. They grow bigger after each molting. And they, a lot of people confuse them with uh, either spiders or ticks, depending on which instar they are. And they like to jump. The fourth instar of spotted lanternfly is red in color with white and black spots. So um, adult, adult uh, spotted lanternflies, they have piercing sucking mouths, as I mentioned before, because they are true bugs and they feed on, on uh, phloem. Uh, for, when first nymphs, uh, first instar nymphs uh, emerge in May or beginning of June, uh, they start feeding on young plants, uh, on uh, tender uh, tips or leaves. And was, once they get older and molt and uh, reach their other uh, instars, then their mouth parts become stronger and then they start feeding more and more woody plant parts. Adults feed on 
uh, woody plant parts like stems and branches and even trunks. Spotted lanternfly egg masses. So um, eggs are brown in color, as you can see, uh, and they are covered with yellowish, brownish, gray, waxy coating. The eggs are usually laid in masses that contain about 30 to 50 eggs, and they usually are deposited in parallel rows. So sometimes, it, like as in this photo, you can see that some egg masses are covered by females and some are not. Uh, we don't know for sure why, but maybe the females got disturbed and they just flew away. Um, last year, I went to Greenwich, one of the Greenwich locations where um, we had established population and I found some egg masses there. And interestingly, they had a little purplish color to me, or it seemed purplish to me. So that's, it's interesting. So egg masses are laid practically on any smooth surface, including trees, stones, trash cans, as you can see here, farm equipment, on vehicles, on sides of the house, um, tires, anything really that is flat, they'll be, they'll be laying their eggs on. Damage caused by spotted lanternfly. So the feeding by a spotted lanternfly can result in wilting of branches of, of the trees and even the death of younger plants uh, because of the sap feeding. As I mentioned before, both uh, nymphs and adults feed on the phloem of the host plants and um, spotted lanternfly does not digest all the sugars uh, in, the, uh, in the tree sap and produce honeydew as a result, which in turn attracts bees, wasps, hornets, and uh, ants, and other nuisance insects. So the honeydew can drop anywhere. Uh, so if you have a picnic table underneath uh, a tree that is infested with a uh, spotted lanternfly, it will drop there. If you park your car, it will drop there on the steps, on the house. And once the honeydew drops, then it creates uh, perfect conditions for sooty mold to grow. And accumulation of honeydew and sooty mold is a nuisance in urban areas. And as you can see, spotted lanternflies, they like to squirm. Uh, so this is a great photo. This is in someone's backyard in Pennsylvania. So, uh, large amounts of uh, spotted lanternflies, and you can see some sooty mold right here. In this photo, the same sooty mold also right here, and also you see uh, honeydew and sap dripping from the trees. So one of the major hosts for spotted lanternfly is Tree of Heaven, uh, or Ailanthus altissima. It is a non-native and invasive species, and uh, it can grow via suckering, and it's really hard to kill it. Uh, if you cut it down, it will just re-sprout, or it will send the suckers out and re-sprout again, not too far away from the main tree that was cut. It grows really well in disturbed areas, and this is why it's so common along highways and railways, side of the roads, and it can actually, uh, outcompete native trees by producing a toxin. Um, one way to identify tree of heaven, um, because a lot of people confuse it with a sumac, they have very similar uh, compound leaves. So one way to identify is to look at the each leaflet. The edge of the leaflet is more um, uh, smooth. It's not tooth, it's more even. And it also has at the bottom, if you look on the back, little scent glands. If you crush the leaves of young uh, tree of heaven, it will have a very specific and pleasant smell, which some people describe as a burn, uh, rancid peanut butter. To me, it smells more like burned sunflower seeds, but it's for sure not a pleasant smell. Uh, 
unfortunately, once the tree is mature, if you crush the leaves, you don't always have that smell. But one of the best ways to identify is to identify the tree is to look at the underside of the tree to look for these scent glands. These are the seed heads uh, of the tree of heaven. So they are called Samaras. They remind me a little bit of a maple tree seeds and their uh, tree of heaven bark is smooth on young trees and mature ones, mature trees have a bark that people describe as cantaloupe skin type of bark. And here's another way to tell the difference between Ailanthus and sumac. Um, the leaf scarf for Ailanthus will be triangular, more like a shield shape and does not enclose lateral bud, whereas uh, sumac, uh, sumac leaf scar is more rounded, uh, C-shaped, and it will enclose the lateral bud. And their, uh, uh, their fruits are berry-like, and they are, uh, instead of looking like uh, maple trees and uh, seeds, So how spotted lanternfly spreads? So spotted lanternfly movement occurs through short range expansion, which is likely influenced by host plant availability and also long distance dispersal. So long distance dispersal uh, is mostly associated with uh, human activity and ground transportation. So spotted lanternflies hitchhike easily. If you are in the area where there are spotted lanternflies, uh, you know, please try to keep your car windows closed because uh, if, uh, it's very likely that they can fly inside and then hitch, uh, hitchhike a ride to another area that way. Um, so also uh, one of the main ways it can be spread is by transporting materials that have egg masses on them. And here I have a photo of, from Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture where it shows all the places, uh, some of the places where the egg masses can be found. So it can be on anything from outdoor light bulbs to furniture to fence po uh, posts, vehicles and camping equipment and so on. As I mentioned before, uh, spotted lanternfly is mostly spread by human intervention. So here is uh, a, a still a work in progress uh, for Connecticut spotted lanternfly uh, checklist. And as you can see, there, there is a huge list of items that we would like people to check before they move, uh, move out or in into the quarantine area. So from things like, again, from motorcycles, motorhomes, tra uh, uh, tarps, household items such as ladders, water hoses, building materials such as bricks, lumber, um, yard and garden items such as fencing and mailboxes and lawnmowers, children toys, and many, many other items that spotted lanternflies can lay eggs on. So how do we manage spotted lanternfly? So, one of the main things uh, to keep in mind is to try to stop the spread. So when, when you travel in and out of the quarantine areas, please check your car and any outdoor, outdoor items you are moving. Uh, check for egg masses in the fall from September to, and winter from September to May, and during other times of the year from May to, uh, really from May to maybe October or even November, if it's not a cold winter or fall, uh, check for adults, nymphs and adults. So keep your car windows rolled up, then you park. W one other way to manage spotted lanternfly is to scrape off the eggs. And here's a picture of, uh, uh, from PA Department of Agriculture. 
uh, we recommend to walk around your property and check for eggs, uh, egg masses on trees, cement blocks, rocks, and other smooth hard surfaces. If you find any egg masses, scrape them off into a bag of, um, or some kind of other container uh, containing rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer. One other way to manage is to trap the trees. Uh, there are tree bands that uh, Penn State recommends, or there's one of the options that they mention. Um, so those tree bands are sticky and they can be wrapped around the trunk. So crawling up spotted lanternfly nymphs and adults get stuck on it. Unfortunately, uh, there are other animals that can get stuck on these tree bands like birds and small mammals like squirrels. So we, we don't recommend uh, those tree bands unless you cage them with wire or some kind of fencing material. And here's a picture of another type of trap, a funnel type of trap, uh, which is also called a circle trap. And uh, this does not have a sticky part, but it wraps around a tree and then the SLF moves up it goes fun is it gets funneled in into this plastic bag or it could be another type of container and um again penn state uh extension has guidelines how to set it up if people would like to do that it's not commercially available it is not an approved method for for example for trapping spotted lanternflies but it's it's one of the management tools Another way to manage spotted lanternfly is to remove host trees, mainly tree of heaven, because it's impossible to move everything else. But even tree of heaven is pretty hard to get rid of since it's an invasive tree, as I mentioned before. Although, uh, and it's widely spread in Connecticut, although it might be beneficial to remove it in some instances. Um, for example, the instance when it might make sense to remove it, it would be maybe close to a vineyard or an orchard. If you have a big grove of, uh, of uh, ailanthus trees, you might want to remove majority of them and leave a few as a trap tree. And then you, uh, that those trees can be treated with insecticides and hence once the spotted lantern flies feed from that tree, they will die. Atlantis tree is though really hard to get rid of since, uh, since it will re-sprout and it requires herbicide application to kill it. Even when treated with herbicide, um, multiple applications might be necessary to completely kill the tree. Very hard to kill it. So next management uh, option is chemical control. So if, uh, if that uh, option is chosen, with, uh, we would like people to make sure and use only pesticides registered by EPA and Connecticut to treat for spotted lanternfly. Uh, home remedies should not be used since they may be unsafe to humans or pets and even plants and also simply might be ineffective. So there are two types of, uh, two groups of insecticides, contact insecticides that can be used for managing spotted lanternfly. Uh, contact insecticides uh, must be used according to the directions on the product label, but generally are sprayed directly on spotted lanternfly and surfaces where they feed and walk, which is uh, oftentimes is the base of a tree. Um, some formulations of these insecticides are available for general use, while others require a pesticide license. Another group of insecticides that can be used to control spotted lanternfly are, uh, is systemic insecticides. And these insecticides are absorbed by the tree roots, and then uh, they are spread throughout the whole tree into bark and leaves and all other parts of the tree. So when the spotted lanternfly feeds on that tree, it, it gets killed. So systemic insecticides can uh, provide good to excellent control for, for several weeks or even months, depending on the chemical used. 
However, most systemic insecticides are in a group called neonicotinoids that include imidacloprid and dinotefurin. These are restricted use chemicals in Connecticut available only to properly licensed applicators and arborists. And, and one other management option is quarantine measures. And that um, after I finish, which I'm almost done with the presentation, Dr. Stafford will uh, talk a little bit about quarantine measures in Connecticut, which will take effect as of July 1st this year. So what can you do about spotted lanternfly? One of the things you can do, one of the things that you can do is spread awareness to other people about spotted lanternfly. Tell your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, so people are aware of it and, and know what to look for. Uh, you can also distribute outreach material. And if you'd like any, please contact me for some if you'd like. I have uh, laminated, laminated posters, uh, scraper cards, like uh, credit card size plastic scraper cards that I could uh, mail to you. I can print out some pest alert sheets with more information about spotted lanternfly and photos. Uh, so please feel free to contact me. I'll be more than happy to send you some. Uh, you could also check for spotted lanternfly nymphs, adults, and egg masses, especially if you are in Fairfield County, but you know it's very likely that it will rapidly spread throughout Connecticut. We also would really appreciate if you report any spotted lanternflies uh, by taking a photo and emailing to report slf at ct.gov. And uh, don't be shy, even if you're not sure if it's a spotted lanternfly, please take a photo and just email it to us. They are very easily identifiable and um, we'd like to get as many uh, inquiries about them as possible and see the, uh, how it spreads. Another option to report spotted lanternfly and also find a little more information is to go on the uh, Connecticut Ex uh, Agricultural Experiment Station's website and click on SLF page and, fill, uh, and either you, you can read through all the information there and see more photos of spotted lanternfly and also you can fill out an SLF reporting form. The address for that uh, page is portal.ct.gov slash CAES dash SLF. So this was a quick rundown on spotted lanternfly. Hopefully it, it, it is helpful. Again, uh, my name is Gerda Magana and I'm a state survey coordinator for the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And if you'd like uh, some of those outreach materials be mailed to you, uh, please feel free to email me uh, or if you have any other questions. But I'll be more than happy to answer your questions right now too. Let me stop sharing the screen and I'll turn on my video. Any questions? And Dr. Stafford will give a little quick update on the quarantine measures after the questions. Uh, thank you. This is Chris Marr, and I am curious about uh, what other states are seeing as far as actual tree mortality. I, it does seem that SLF does have an interest in a wide variety of trees. But my understanding is it's there's not widespread tree mortality, maybe just some smaller pockets of saplings dying here and there. Yes. Yeah, so in terms of post mortality, uh, it most of the time exactly it does not uh, directly cause especially mature tree more uh, you know death but it will weaken them and there's a higher chance for them to die. Uh, the, the mortality that is uh, really associated with uh, SLF that they see in Pennsylvania would be in grapevines and vineyards. So um, 
there were there are quite a few vineyards that had uh, SLF infestations, and then um, it the spotted lanternfly really weakened the grape wines uh, and the vines, and then they uh, they were not able to withstand the cold winters and they died. So those are the only ones that I, I can think of at the moment. Um, yeah, this is Vicki. Um, Chris, um, most of the forest um, people that I've talked to have said the jury is still kind of out on uh, forest tree mortality. If anything, they're afraid that it would affect regeneration, uh, such as uh, growth from the smaller uh, trees, but uh, the jury is still kind of out. Um, the big issues right now are with the grape uh, and wine industry, um, because those are going to be hardest hit. We do have evidence that, that a mature vineyard can be killed as, in as quickly as two years from spotted lanternfly. But in terms of forest trees, um, I think the jury is still out. Um, we have a question in the chat. Is there any work on for pheromone traps being done? Um, I think there's quite a bit of work being done with pheromone traps. Uh, but again, um, that's just in its beginning stages. And um, we really don't have a good pheromone trapping method um, that's out there. Yeah, and similarly, it's like there's a lot of research going on in the early stages, uh, you know, the question is like biological control. And so there are some efforts to find natural, you know, parasites or predators uh, in its native range, just like was done for emerald ash borer um, for a spotted lanternfly. Um, and similarly for brown marmorated stink bug, there was efforts along that line as, as well, but that, that's for down the road. Uh, so there's no biological controls at this point. So any other questions? So just a quick update then, I will mention that uh, the, we, what we decided to do here in Connecticut with the discovery of the spotted lanternfly in, you know, in some uh, small areas in three towns in Fairfield County, and given the, the rate of spread that we've noticed in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, uh, we decided to basically, from a regulatory point of view, quarantine the whole state because we know it's gonna spread fairly quickly and then establish regulated areas where we know there's established populations in terms of trying to slow the spread of this insect. So uh, any, you saw in the um, Gerda's talk, you know, the eggs can be on anything. And we've also seen, you know, those interceptions we had uh, coming in on vehicles, um, surprisingly even sheds that were shipped here into the state so uh from pennsylvania so you know the, they can be on almost anything uh particularly the eggs so we want people to basically run uh, for homeowners um and in private individuals to use the checklist to make sure they're not moving infested materials um but the main focus of the regulations given the size of our plant industry uh, is to provide a mechanism for um, our nurseries to be able to continue to inspect and ship spotted lantern-free material. And that'll be done either through inspections and phytosanitary certificates or complying with a um, compliance agreement where they agree to uh, basically oversee and inspect all of their material before it it ships. We're in the process of establishing fact sheets that'll go up on our website, as well as the compliance agreements that will also go on our website and may, be made available to our producers. There's another question in the chat. Are there any reports that they are attracted to lights? Um, VL, VL. Not that I heard of. Um, they are more attracted from what I heard of to tall objects like um, light posts, but it's not really the light, it's the, the tall posts because they like to launch off them um, and tall trees. Yeah, I have not heard of any. 
reports? No, I don't know of any uh, information that they would be attracted to lights or not. Just like what Gerda said is their behavior is, is when their population Get, reaches a certain point, and I don't know what that is, is that they do this behavior called swarming. And it's it's not like bees, um, but it's similar in that it's a mass aggregation. And they'll find the tallest thing that they can find, whether it's a tree or a utility pole or whatever, and they will all climb to the top of it and fly away in a cloud. So it's just kind of an interesting behavior. Um, the other question from Chris Martin, I've heard SLS has major impacts to outdoor recreation. Um, uh, examples are, um, imagine if you're sitting outside with your family having a nice picnic on a beautiful summer day and all of a sudden you'd start getting rained upon by spotted lanternfly excrement. I mean, that's really unpleasant to think about. Um, the other impact that the spotted lanternfly has related to the excrement is that um, it's very attractive to sooty mold and um, sooty mold is like black kind of slippery, slimy looking stuff that grows on surfaces. And it also uh, is slippery and people have been reported to slip and fall in the uh, uh, excrement and, um, um, you know, have, have bruises and broken bones and that sort of thing. I have not heard of any park closures due to spotted lanternfly, but there probably are some out there. Um, they just make a real mess where they occur in large numbers. Um, they're, they're just, I, I've called it a quality of life pest, and I think that that's a pretty good description because uh, you just don't want to be outside when these things are in large numbers and raining their excrement down on everything. Um, Penn State has put out some very interesting videos that show this, and it's just really disgusting because it does look like rain, and it's actually just bug poop. So, yeah. Yeah, so Chris, that could conceivably impact use of certain state parks if you end up with established populations around areas, you know, your picnic ground areas and things like that uh, in terms of, you know, people wanting to use the facilities if those populations aren't addressed um, there. And you probably want to control them to help prevent or spread anyway. But yes, I could see how it, in certain cases it could certainly uh, impact people's willingness to or use of certain picnic areas for example like Vicky mentioned okay. looks like no other questions so thank you so much everyone for joining us today um, again, feel free to email me if you'd like some outreach material or if you have more questions. And